We're here with Pat Mastelato, and uh, what can we say? You, you've seen the introduction. Pat, I think, is just one of those non-generational, non-genre-specific uh, musicians who just has done so many things across the map. Um, Pat, I just wanted to start with, uh, give us some thoughts on your first memory of falling in love with music. What, what were some of the first couple of things you heard and, and you said? Really? That's what I got to do. Uh, falling in love with, uh, well, I guess it would have been uh, the One-Eyed Purple People Eater. Maybe that was a big one on our playlist. Uh, stuff like that with my sister. Uh, I guess Lassie had a theme song. Um, yeah. Let's think. There was something about, uh, oh, yeah, we love that one, smoking cigarettes and watching Captain Kangaroo. Uh, what was that song? I forget what that was called, but that was... Uh, my sister and I, little Catholic school kids, you know, that was really, woo, smoking cigarettes. <laughs> um, you know, then uh, the British invasion hit. I, I can't remember before the British invasion if I really had any uh, deep connection to music. But when the British invasion hit, um, for me, that was third grade. I can kind of specifically remember I was going to a school in uh, uh, King City near Los Banos and Paso Robles. We had a, a trailer. The Catholic school was a, was about, I don't know, 20 kids. So they had a trailer, you know, first through fourth grade and fifth through eighth. And uh, it was a Chicano girl I used to ride to school with. We, we went with her, uh, we, we carpooled. And uh, she would, first girl I ever saw ratting her hair, but she was mad for the Beatles. And she was, uh, was just 17 was the song that was her song. And I remember that, uh, and then they were on Ed Sullivan. And uh, wow, yeah. my family was living in a trailer also. So my sister and I were put to bed. It was a long skinny trailer, but we could, we could look through to the kitchen area and see the TV and watch the Beatles. Um, I think that's where my connection, you know, the British invasion is what did it. What an image, just watching that little TV down the end of the trailer. Yeah, probably about a... <laughs> six inch screen you know it was this little avocado green i inherited that tv later and i've been reminded of this by a couple people but uh later in the uh, i don't know late 70s when i'm playing top 40 disco gigs i would bring that same tv with me i also had a night watchman gig so i bring this tv with me a lot uh, that's the TV I watched Devo on Saturday Night Live oh. when I was out in the middle of some rock quarry uh, sure. earning five bucks an hour or something. Um, so the one I take to the same thing I take to the gigs, I could put it back on my floor, Tom, and watch uh, the Midnight Special while I had these top 40 gigs. Uh, I couldn't turn the volume up, but I could visually, you know, watch as the show came on. There were no reruns in those days. Uh, uh, so here's the funny part of the story is the TV didn't have a good connection. So I'd have to play a drum fill that would end with a floor Tom that I could actually hit the top of the TV to get the picture to come back. <laughs> and, uh, and I have some buddies that I recently reconnected with that remember, they say, you remember you had that TV and you would swing around and slap that thing. And then you get all excited watching somebody on TV while we were playing a disco song. <laughs> That's it. great. And you would do a Fonzie on it and hit the TV to get it to work. I Oh, yeah, it was about those days. That's, that's great. That, that's a great, great story. Tell us a little bit about how you made that jump into being a sessions player and playing with Pointer Sisters and Patti LaBelle and folks like that. Was that kind of late 70s, early 80s? Uh, Where was the transition there? We late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I moved to L.A. in 74, I think, uh, summer, just before the bicentennial, if I remember right, because uh, that had been 76. I don't remember for sure. But I was not quite 18, and uh, my dream was to be a session musician. And uh, my best understanding of that was... Uh, was somebody like Jim Gordon, where I could see he's mm. playing with Derek and the Dominoes, he's playing with Joe Cocker, he's playing with George. This is the best in the world, you know. This guy Russ got every gig going. I thought that that's that's what I want to do. Um, and I, I hooked up in LA um, with some characters right away. So I started to do recording sessions right away. You know, there there was no drum machine then, so we could mm. get. Uh, I'm trying to think. One of my first sessions was Dobie Gray for oh, a stale. Yeah. 
but I didn't play on that track. I played on demos for the guy, mm -hmm. or they might not have met his songs. Maybe these songs people were pitching to him. Um, uh, one of the other first sessions I had was at ABC Dunhill. The one for Doby, I think, was off of Vine. I guess that would be Capital. Um, the uh, the one with with at ABC Dunhill that was Juice Newton. I would pick up those little little tabs of paper at the Guitar Center. When I moved to LA, I was working every straight gig I could find uh, through my dad, as well as I did phone solicitation crap and the you know cold calling people to try and sell carpet, um, which I never sold. Uh, but okay. also take every audition and every gig I could take at the same time. And one of these was uh, it was uh, the Silver Spur, which was uh, Juice and Otha and I forget the bass player's name. And they wanted to add a drummer for their uh, showcase gig at the Troubadour. So I hadn't lived in LA very long. And um, and I did their rehearsal with some steakhouse out in the valley. And then we did the gig, I guess, that night, probably like a hoot night gig. And um, I remember I had a big fucking mistake, which was uh, you come in big for the second chorus, yada boosh da da chorus, and I did that for the first chorus, and the whole all the team stopped and looked around like wrong. <laughs> uh, not that it probably really mattered, but anyway, I was pretty embarrassed. Um, and I thought that gig was over, but a day or two later they called and said we're going to the studio. They took me in. It was Bones Howe, if you remember that guy. He was the producer with the Nation and maybe the Mamas and Papas. Oh yeah. And this was at ABC Dunhill, uh, you know, Steppenwolf and Steely Dan. And like, wow, I felt like I'd arrived and uh, cut the whole record that day, which was actually the demos. So as you can imagine, a year or two go by, she comes out as Juice Newton, a lot of the same material. And it's on Capitol, I think, when she was finally released. And uh, and that's Hal Blaine and Jeff Porcaro and those guys. Sure. Uh, and I'm just beating around doing every gig I can. Um, and um, let me think how that would have worked out. But I ended up meeting Mike Chapman. I, yeah. I was working with yeah, two different girls at, at some point, probably around 79-ish, 78, 79. Holly Penfield, she was a girl from the Bay Area that I knew a little bit. She was managed by, uh, uh, originally by Bill Graham, and then later by uh, Bud Prager that was managing Foreigner. And I think at the time it was Bud car that had taken over as a manager who is involved with a lot of things still i see his name show up in a lot of film work um managed kansas so she had a lot of things going on and we're searching for a record deal cutting demos all the time and simultaneously i'm playing with this girl named shandy which was a bit more of a punk band and we were playing uh live a lot more than we were recording i think we just did one or two sessions uh, which had jimmy haslip on bass so how oh, great nice. was that yeah nice. it's uh, Phil Brown and Jimmy Haslip originally were the lineup of the band with me and Paul Herzog. And um, I really dug her music. But anyway, I, I reached a situation where they both got record deals with uh, Dreamland. Dreamland was a subsidiary label on RSO, Robert Stigwood's label. Sure. Uh, this was Mike Chapman and Nikki Chen. And mm -hmm. you know, right? The sweet, blondie, mm -hmm. the knack. Blondie for sure. A lot more, well, originally they were the songwriters. If you think back to Ballroom Blitz and stuff mm -hmm. like that, A Little Willie, <laughs> that's uh, Mike's song about his dick. And uh, <laughs> all these other bands that we didn't really know in the States, uh, Mud, Smokey, they never had hits here. Chapman told me, oh, we'd just come to the States and hear what was on the radio by the Eagles or somebody and go home and, and re, you know, cop the, the feel of that and, uh, and rewrite a song and have a hit. Um, so the problem was that Mike Chapman signed Shandy. He fell in love with her and started coming to the gigs. And uh, and Nikki Chin fell in love with uh, with Holly Penfield. So they brought me into the office once they realized they had the same drummer in both bands. So I was kind of in big trouble for a while. Um, they told me I'd done a disservice to the artist. I should never work with more than one act. And, and, and I had to make a decision and yada, yada, yada. And uh, Holly was already taking very good care of me, a couple hundred bucks a week um, as a retainer. So I had to stay there. I did stay there. I love Holly, but uh, it was painful to leave the other gig. They auditioned drummers for ages. They went in to cut the record. They weren't happy. She fired that drummer and they hired me back under the condition that I had to get the record done in like five days or something crazy, uh, which was pretty easy really in those days. You just set yeah. up and play. I don't think we used a click track. Anyway, Mike started to use me on a lot of little things as his overdub boy in LA. Uh, 
I didn't play with Blondie or, or The Knack, but I did lots of other stuff with Mike, a lot of songwriting stuff he did. We did the demos for um, Love is a Battlefield, Obsession, right. uh, a lot of different stuff. Sure, um, sure. So um, work, more work, just, you know, it just sort of piles on. And um, um, I guess it was about 83-ish. I'd, I'd done some other work. I had a hit with Martin Briley. Martin Briley, I, sure. That, that's, yes. uh, I wanted to ask about that. Well, well look, if I can interject, I want to say this is great because, you know, there's a million interviews with every detail about King Crimson, which are spectacular interviews, but we're not going to do that today. I love that you're going in the direction of some of the pop stuff because I want to ask about that. And um, I call it, you know, six degrees of Pat Mastelato because it's just, if people go look up just the folks you just talked about, it's incredibly uh, a rich area of things. And, and as the longest running drummer of, of King Crimson, that great band, there's so many interviews about that, but perfect. M Martin Briley, because one of the things that, uh, uh, that I love is that I, there's like these three sign point, signposts in, in my view as a music fan, where you've got the Martin Briley, uh, uh, Salt of My Tears, the big hit, and then the middle of the 80s with Mr. Mr., and then the end of the 80s with the incredible epic record with XTC, Oranges and Lemons. Well, Mart Martin was produced by Peter Coleman, and Peter Coleman was Mike Chapman's engineer, a great guy, and, uh, and actually he was just peeling away from Mike then. Um, they had done the Pat Benatar record mm -hmm. and I think Mike did one song and didn't want to finish the record or whatever. I don't really know. And Peter Coleman finished that record, which had some big hits. Uh, similar then with uh, Nick Gilder, which was an interesting gig because I had tried to get that gig and lost that gig a couple of times and then ended up getting it later, but I didn't get to play on the hit records. Um, oh boy. Those. And, it, and he also did at the same time, Exile. Uh, mm. I want you all over. And if you check out, I want to kiss you all over and hot child in the city. They're the same song upside down, flip backwards, inside out, change the lyric. Yes. Uh, but they're really the, the same song. Um, but yeah, so I got a lot of experience with Mike and another beautiful thing with Mike was that he had leased, um, before it was called ocean way, it was United Western. I think it's called cello now or East West, but the old Putnam rooms, um, Mike, leased out studio three i think they call it the room on the right the smaller room but had a lot of history that's the beach boys and just all sorts of history and later xtc and all sorts of other records so i have a great affinity for that room because mike leased it for a year he said i'll lease it for a year if you put this flying fader uh neve desk whatever you wanted so they built the room for him not built the room but uh refurbished the gear like Mike wanted. And then Mike would have a month's work in New York with another act, with Blondie or somebody. He'd come west to do the overdubs maybe. But in the meantime, he just threw us the keys. Me and the other guys in Holly and Chandy's band and the engineer, Doug the boy, and he'd say, just work, write songs, do stuff. So it gave me a lot of time to, uh, uh, you know, record in a, in a super pro situation uh, without a budget, without a, uh, a time limit, you know. Um, that's great. yeah. Uh, that's how did that lead to Martin Briley? Was just because Peter ended up getting Martin's gig, and uh, we did that over at MCA Whitney, which is a different studio out in Glendale. Really, really high ceilings. Uh, that was really at, in those days. That was the chin chap sound. Was uh, MCA Whitney to track the drums? That's where they did the knack. My Sharona's in there. Uh, it's an interesting room because we shared that room. Mike Chapman rented it out enough that he had a third of the bookings of that MCA room. And the other two thirds were Jews for Jesus, some kind of a choir sing along thing. So sometimes when I'd arrive, there'd be school buses full of choirs leaving or, or coming into session. And the third act that we shared those rooms with at that time uh, for a couple of years there on and off, because uh, we did a lot of records there, um, was the Walrus of Love, help me out. Uh, uh -huh. Uh, I'll think of his name. You got it. They had all the rings because one time I'm at the desk listening to the playback and it got really dark because the light over the console was covered and it was him reaching over. That's a uh, loving Barry, Barry, White, Barry White. Barry White. Barry White. I, I didn't know that song by him or not the title, but okay. Yeah. That's no, around the town they call it the wall. That's his the kind of a nickname, right? That's right. 
I, I felt this feeling over me and it was him. He'd come back to the studio because he'd forgotten his rings. They were sitting on the desk. So he had to reach over me. Um, but anyway, it was just great times. So that was a great record. And um, That's yeah, great. Yeah. No, that, uh, great record. And that's great to hear about the, the, you're answering so many of my questions without me asking because one of the things is, is your, your, your 80s drum aesthetic, which usually that's a bad phrase, but, but I think there's a beautiful thing where you're, you're um, uh, on all of those records, uh, what you're doing with drums is uh, subtle, you know, it, it's, uh, it's never overpowering and it doesn't have that corny 80s wash of reverb thing. Those very three different things, the Martin stuff, the Mr. Mr. stuff and the XTC. Uh, of course, people know the, the Mr. Mr. years and, and those huge hits that you guys had. Uh, and then 2010 with, with the, the pull record, because I think that's a, wow, some really strong tunes on that. And we know the story where that just record company stuff and it. Oh, yeah, I'll give you a quick fast forward. How did I slip through this? So by the time I met Rich and Slug, Well, working with Chapman, he had a beatbox. He'd been doing Heart of Glass, and he had that similar to an 808. And I'd had a small little rhythm ace Roland since the 70s. It was I couldn't play very well with a click, but I could play pretty good with a with a rhythm. All that shit. But talk, talk, talk. It was just buried underneath my kick and snare. And it's like I don't hear the click. I don't. I'm freaking out. So uh, anyway. Uh, when I met the Misters, the drum machine became a big part of our life. And they'd been auditioning drummers for about a year. So they bought a Lindrum. I couldn't afford a Lindrum, but when I auditioned, uh, which was a very quick audition, maybe 45 minutes we played together. And at the end they said, come back tomorrow and you can take the drum machine. So I was like, whoa, they just dropped this, you know, about what were they four grand in those days? Oh so yeah. Like, that... So that, that changed everything. I could program parts. Uh, that led to songwriting because accidentally, incidentally, I'd, I'd create beats and then Rich would write tracks over them. Um, and that's the Pointer Sisters tracks. Uh, they were originally going to be, I think, for, I'm not sure who they were for, actually. There were two or three different songwriting uh, excursions, which is what we did a lot with the Misters. Every time we get together, if we weren't specifically rehearsing for a tour, then we were songwriting. We were trying mm -hmm. to pop us virtually every day we got together, even if we didn't finish it. Uh, it might've been Boz Skaggs because people would ask Rich and Slug for songs in those mm. days. And, uh, and uh, Kyrie was, was for Al Jarreau. I remember that. They, wow. they asked me demo they had started. It was much, much, much different. And uh, that was when I said, hey, I got an idea for this one. So, uh, and then by the time the misters had ended the xtc call that came from paul fox uh paul was another guy that i did a lot of sessions with uh, late 70s early 80s some of those demos uh used to do a lot of demos at mca whitney uh, underneath uh, where you play at universal amphitheater in those office buildings down below there's these uh, there's a studio which was a demo room it was glenn ballard cliff magnus um, I can't think of all the songwriters that they would have had on staff. So same sort of thing I described with the misters. These guys were trying to go in every day and, and pop a song, you know, in like four hours. So drum set stayed set up and it was usually me and Davey Farragher and Dennis Herring and Paul Fox. And we'd come in, you know, not nine to noon and cut a couple, three or four songs for somebody. Um, this was just before the drum machine took all those gigs away. Yeah. Um, um, and that's how Paul came to know me. And, you know, like most players, you don't have a gig in the afternoon. You go out and smoke some weed after you're done. Me and Paul share music. I think I actually turned Paul on to XTC. We were really into Thomas Dolby then, listening to those records together. So a few years later, uh, Paul was getting more production work, and he'd call me to do an overdub or, you know, uh, help him fix something. And uh, and then one day he called and said, I got another gig for you, and it's XTC. And I'm like, bullshit and he's like no i'm serious he says uh i'm totally convinced that he's bullshitting me and uh you know in those days did you know robbie eagle i was just thinking of robbie eagle. know the name but i don't know him no, yeah he was my mistress then he went on to do prince and yes and stuff so i thought you might have crossed that him and dallas shoe robbie, yeah. robbie dallas shoe were our two crew guys with the mistress and uh 
I forget what I was going to tell you that Robbie said that was funny. Anyway, um, what else do you need to know? <laughs> so that, yeah, no, that that's great. And the the oranges and lemons. I mean, there's it's just a. I hope drummers that that know you from later stuff check that out because you got to do some really creative stuff in there. And and I love the hybrid thing that you you embraced drum machines early on. It's good to hear where that started because of course there's a thread there that goes right through your current work with King Crimson. You've always got electronics and the K2 and all the things. So I love that we, we now know uh, that it's very early on that you embraced electronics. But, but even on that record, there's some really cool stuff. There's come the, the Zairean kind of uh, rhythmic stuff and the Sukus kind of rhythms. Uh, you know, there's some really cool stuff on that record. Uh, I guess those guys had quit touring by that point. What a shame. It was talked about. It was even uh, uh, after the record was released and there was some, some interest at radio. They talked about doing a radio tour, which they eventually did as an acoustic tour. Uh, at one point, they wanted me to fly over. They were going to do uh, play live in the studio, bring an audience in to try and help Andy uh, get over his phobia of, the, of an audience. Uh, so they were going to have us uh, live in the studio. But then at the last minute, that all went. Yeah, it didn't, didn't happen. Well, well, going straight from being able to work with electronics, which a lot of drummers just shunned drum machines as, as as we know, uh, I think what's also interesting is, is you've worked with so many great drummers, too, and you're very comfortable with that. Of course, the Crimson Double Trio with Bruford and then the duo with Terry and uh, Hobo Lema. And, uh, and the recent uh, stuff with Tobias Ralph, which is a great record. And Tobias is killer. A guy doesn't get enough credit. He's amazing. He's amazing. Beautiful, beautiful person. Hilarious to hang with. He's so quiet until he pops open. You have no idea. Yes. You know what I'm talking about, dude, because we've been together with him. <laughs> uh, yeah, love the guy. Uh, yeah, we stay in good touch, actually. There's a lot of, a lot of little, little texting and jostling back and forth between us, even as the years go by that we don't get to play together. Uh, there's some extra politics around all that that made it weird. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to play with other drummers. Um, I, I, I need the help. I'm, a, I'm appreciative to have a, a buddy. Um, you know, um, I, I'm lucky that the opportunities present themselves. And uh, there's so many other guys that, that uh, Stefan Passborg, I don't know if you know that cat. I play with uh, him and Shell uh, with IB, uh, Morgan Algren, Matt's Morgan. Uh, Morgan Algren, yeah. Um, uh, just, you know, uh, Samuli, the guy that played with K2 originally, that uh, uh, was the electronic percussionist with me there. Uh, Samuel, Samuli Kosimun, Kosimun, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong because I pronounced his name once and uh, Kimo looked at me and says, you just call him a mule. <laughs> So uh, my, my pronunciation spelling is, is crap. Um, yeah, I don't know what to tell you, dude. It's a pleasure to play with another, a good drummer. Uh, and these guys you're mentioning are all beyond good. So, uh, well, that's, yeah. that's why they pick you. I, you know, I, I really hope that somewhere there's outtakes or maybe some video of you and Bill Bruford working out uh, Ba-Boom. What a beautiful, that right into Thrack. I hope people uh, watching this all know that because what an amazing, you know, creation that was. Um, well, as I recall, we did it originally up at Applehead. You know, when, when, when Crimson involving me started in 94, um, they'd already booked time up in Woodstock. So they were committed to that studio. So that's where we met Bill and I. Uh, actually, we'd met the year before backstage, uh, backstage at Royal Albert Hall when David Sylvia played there is where I first uh, spoke with Bill. I think that was the first time. But uh, we met there at Applehead and uh, started recording what became Vroom. It was a Vroom record. And um, I guess we did that the very first time we were together. Robert had it booked for about a week or so. 
Um, so we had to be composing and recording pretty much simultaneously. Oh yeah, because uh, Dave Bottrell came. And then there was a big problem with the desk because we needed so many inputs. Uh, they had to keep sending down to Manhattan to bring up cables or converters or I, I can't think of all expansion chassis and things. So we probably had Monday through Saturday figured to track and by about Wednesday they were still plugging gear in and by Thursday when I changed my drum heads uh, they were overdubbing. So the stuff that we cut early in the week were the tracks. Um, did we do Baboom on that record? Because we definitely worked on, it up there. On Thrack, yes, yes. It, it, but yeah. Okay, it's not on so not, the no. record. We were already preparing it. I guess we finished working it up down in South America. The, the way Crimson worked in the beginning of that first year was we had rehearsal um, sometime in the spring that was the recording of the room record. And then we were to go back up to Woodstock a second time to rehearse and, and learn the older material uh, to play in South America. Uh, but when we went back up to Woodstock, there was a bit of, of a problem. There was a Woodstock festival. Was it Woodstock 94 something? That would have been it. Yeah, sure. The big uh, 25th year. I book. So when we went back up there in August, it was impossible getting flights, getting a car in and out. I, I'm not sure if we rehearsed or just scrapped it. And then we resumed in uh, Buenos Aires, and uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and did... Uh, about a week of rehearsal and songwriting there and then started to do gigs there for about a month is how we played in the material. So we were certainly playing Baboom there. In fact, I can remember because we had a great LD and he would backlight us in that theater we played finally in, uh, in Buenos Aires that uh, it was great. And sitting on stage, I could see these gigantic shadows of Bill and I. Uh, it, it was pretty cool. Yeah, uh, just massive. You know, we were like, I don't know, 70, or 100 foot shadows across the theater going up into the balcony. Uh, yeah, it was, it was backlit. Um, yeah. Spectacular. Uh, so we started working on it in, uh, at Applehead. We must have debuted it down there. Um, yeah. Great, great stuff. Um, and, and yes, as you said about Tobias, very funny guy. I've been um, fortunate to tour with him, of course, many times with Adrian Ballou, and he's, he looks like this quiet, mellow guy and just a riot very funny tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now um what, what's coming up and what i mean in this pandemic time are you doing some recording are you what's what's going on in the next little while um well i told you i'm gonna mow my yard that's next <laughs> on my list just um, sample it well um well, I've been doing a lot. I have, I have a studio here. I started to make a, uh, a vocal booth, actually. Started to be a little bit more pro. And uh, so I'm recording all the time. This is, I'm actually sitting in the corner of my control room. So that's kind of my, my tracking space. I got some new old speakers. I went old school, like the ones we used to have at United Western, the Yuri's oh. and stuff like that. And then I have a room right here that's, I'm upstairs in my house that's uh, full of drums. Wow. wow. Yeah, it's pretty overwhelming. So I usually start my mornings on my rowing machine and then I move across the... Anyway, so between all that, yes, I'm constantly busy recording, as busy as I want to be. There's a new ORC record, ORK. We've got about 25 songs. Um, we hit another level of songwriting about three or four months ago. So the most recent 10 songs are probably the strongest. Um, I did some stuff for Frost. You know that band Frost? Uh, I heard British the name, band. yeah. I heard saw the him once yeah. on, the, on the Prague cruise. Uh, they're great. Greg, uh, Greg Brundell was their drummer. There's another project I just did some tracking with is uh, Jonas Reingold that plays with Flower Kings. He plays mm -hmm. with Steve Hackett now. And, and Greg Brundell. And the keyboard player, I'm drawing a blank on his name. I'm sorry about that, buddy. Um, but they have a new thing that's coming out. I think they're going to call it Backstage. Um, and I'm their guest on one or two songs. Uh, uh, let's think. What else? I mean, I, I, I forget, dude, but it's, it's constant. Great. <laughs> Stickman, we haven't actually started a new Stickman record yet. I did some tracking for Tony earlier. I think he's making a solo record, maybe. Tony is on the side. I did some stuff with Marcus. The stuff we did with Gary Husband, we did some... A little bit of editing on that here. Um, 
uh, what was I going to say there? This other thing with Marcus, uh, Tim Gardner. Um, um, I did something for the Rembrandts. I was just talking for, with Danny, emailing a couple months ago. And another guy that I hadn't played with, uh, Bob Gray. Uh, I hadn't played with him since the 76, 77 in LA. We were in bands together and then fell apart and reconnected through uh, Facebook and uh, ended up cutting a track for him last month. Um, um, a lot of that. It's no, it's it's great because this has been the whole journey, and that's what's so uh, fascinating about not only being a, a dear friend but a fan of of your work because it's all over the place. Whether it's K two and Tuner and the Stickman and all the things we've talked about, programming for Kim Mitchell. I mean, it's oddball moments like that. I'm a huge fan of Max Webster, Kim Mitchell. Uh, that that's an odd one. How did that come about? You know. It, oh. Okay, here's an interesting thing because I'm just turning 65 this year. So I'm finding out that the musician union has a little bit of a pension, but they've got a little bit of a big pension problem. <laughs> the pension is about poof. Uh, and I'm just getting to the point where I'm checking in to see if there's a pension. Um, the union never got me a gig. All the gigs come word of mouth. So Kim Mitchell came through Paul Duvillier and uh, Paul was our co-producer engineer buddy on Broken Wings on the hit record with Mr. Mr. Uh, so uh, Paul called later, would I come over and help with the track? Uh, actually the drum, Lou Molino, Lou was playing drums and maybe he had to spin off to do uh, Trevor Raven. He was doing Trevor around the same time. So um, I can't exactly remember, but I did a track or two or, Sure. I don't really remember. Sure, sure. I'm not sure if I did overdubs or played. That's uh, great. Right around that time, time was School of Fish. That was another really cool band. I was very excited about that. We did that maybe even the same week. Oh, you know what else I did right then was the bass player that played so much with Marianne, Fernando Sanders. Mm. That was an interesting session because I was warned, uh, Mark McKenna was engineering, and Mark said, you got to stand close to him when he talks because he mumbles. And I realized he's going to what the hell i have no idea what the and i'm looking at mark and mark's nodding like i, I warned you <laughs> uh but anyway school of fish that was an awesome band and then josh freeze came in and cut the drums after me and ended up with a gig and that's where i first go wow josh freeze is like amazing kid so um, good yeah yeah but that was a really a good band um anyway just just word of mouth that's how the pointer sisters and actually, the Pointer Sisters, as I mentioned, and several of these things were uh, the Al Jarreau track. They were things that were for, uh, that Richard and Slug were writing. And most of them were actually the demos. And then the demos, you know, like we cut Watching the World. Uh, we cut it for the Mr.'s record also. But then they took our beatbox and our basic track and they did it with... Um, uh, Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan has a version with Phil Collins playing drums, uh, uh, produced by Arif Martin. So uh, anyway, these things are all kind of internested. Uh, so interconnected. We, we need to do like a, a, a family tree because, you know, the six degrees thing, I mean, Fernando Sa Saunders and well, with Kim Mitchell, it leads to Rush and all these other bands. And then uh, there's a connection to the Grateful Dead that I always think about because because Robin... Ooh. Yeah, because I, I'm a nerd with this kind of connection stuff. But but Robin Sylvester, um, of course, uh, he he was with Rat Dog with Bob Weir for years. Robin, so, the uh, bass player. Yeah, yeah, he played with Rat I Dog. I never knew that. Yeah, yeah. So oh, you he know, was great. He was the Martin Briley bass player. That's sure, exactly. Robert. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, and uh, he had a a Turner bass. Is that what they were called? Where the uh, pickup you could adjust, move it around. It's like a rotary pickup, right? And he was a sweetheart, dude. And he told me a story, which I should never repeat, that he was in a studio where the Beatles were recording and he went over and stole a pair of Ringo sticks. <laughs> no, uh, maybe he only took one. Maybe it was broken. I'm not sure. But he shared that with me because he still carried the guilt, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Did he let you play with those? Um, no, 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 no. They weren't at our session. He was just, while we were tracking there at Whitney one time, he reflected back to some session ages ago and, I, sure. guess, I don't know well and, and sorry, another, sorry robin <laughs> and another connection is martin briley apparently uh arthur brown was a teacher of him when they were younger in england didn't you work with arthur um yeah yeah that's more recently uh yeah. 
the deal with Arthur, you know, he lives here in Texas. He has yeah. for quite a while. And actually, he had a, a house painting company with uh, Chris Blackwell. Is that the, Jimmy uh, Carl the guy Black, who's that? Right? Jimmy, Jimmy Carl Black. Black. Yeah. Black and brown painting. Yeah. Brown and black, black and brown Brilliant. painting company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's um, great. And then Arthur made a record a couple of years ago where he recut fire and some stuff. So yeah, I went over and did a few overdubs. Uh, I've never toured with Arthur. I've met him a few times there and talked. And uh, yeah. yeah, we had, uh, in fact, what's kind of a sad memory now is uh, Arthur and Jamie Oldecker uh, at Mike's uh, New Year's Eve get together a couple of years, uh -huh. maybe five years ago now but jamie just passed a few days ago oh, and uh, that's man. the last time i saw him was there over at mike's place they're called scandal and yes, their drummer yes. was tommy tommy price mm -hmm. and tommy about halfway through that record got the gig with billy idol right so he he, he would have left to do billy's tour or i'm not i don't really know uh, so they finished tracking the record in New York with uh, a couple other great drummers. And one of the tracks they weren't happy with was Only the Young. So then they came out west to L.A. It was Rick Chertikoff um, and Mike Chapman. They were buddies. I think Chertikoff was the producer, but Mike was around. And um, and they brought out uh, Bill Whitman uh, to engineer. A very unusual session for me because we were at MCA Whitney, a studio I'd used a lot recording with Mike and, and Mike and Peter Coleman had a specific drum sound, you know, very, very roomy, very hard attack sound in their sound. They use a KM84 microphone uh, on a double boom mic stand as high as you could get it in the ceiling. And then we'd spend forever with broomsticks trying to get that to point directly down at the snare drum to, you know, get isolation from that distance on a microphone. And, um, uh, Anyway, just very different sound when Will was getting sounds and uh, he wanted bigger and bigger cymbals. I put up the biggest cymbals I had and he covered them with a towel and mic'd the hi-hats from underneath. It was really bizarre uh, to me. But anyway, we spent the whole day getting sounds and tracking and, uh, and then they let me know that they're gonna go into record and that I'm gonna erase this other famous drummer and there's, there's no Pro Tools then, <laughs> you know? I've done this before other sessions where they say, Hey, you know, you're going to play over so-and-so and, -so and, and he's gone. And I'm saying, please just make a safety or so. anyway. Uh, that's that track. So oh, we actually came in the next day to get the track, to get the track done. But it, it becomes for me, at least a very worrisome feeling, dude. It's like, there's no, there's no way back. And, yeah. uh, you know, you play it easy when it's easy. And then the more you play it, the simple thing gets harder and harder that's, to play and um yeah so no, great story and i i just assumed it was a regular session from the from the top but that's a great no. great no, song no. though and and then and yeah. then there was some stuff well, they in, were they were ahead of journey i don't know yeah. if they didn't know journey was gonna i don't really know the background of, of how yeah. they picked that song i think it was meant to be their single but i think journey right. beat them beat them to yeah. it well, well, those guys wrote it. Uh, it's it's a, Steve Perry, Neil Schoen, Jonathan Cain wrote it. Oh, there you go. It. Yeah, okay. and, and they gave it to Scandal or, or sold it to them. And then it, it, I guess it was so good, they said, well, we're going to do it. But um, great. Uh, thanks for fleshing that out. But, um, well, yeah, man, I, I know I know you're, you're tight on time. And, and you know. Well, it the, gets the, hot in Texas. The sun's <laughs> coming out, you know. Pretty soon I, I'm going to try and mow, and I'm going to look out there and go, oh, man, I can't. Yeah. It's too. Actually, it's kind of overcast today. It's not so bad. Okay. No. Well, let's let's let's. You know, we can wrap there. I mean, we could do we could do a part two sometime. But um, Pat, thank you so much for uh, chatting on a hot Texas day. Really appreciate it. It's cool up here. It, right inside. <laughs> I want to share this look because it was so good. Once I was trying to figure out where to do you from. Where to do you from? Uh, <laughs> How did I do it before? Where I had that deep dark. Yeah, I can just sort of fade, fade away. Yeah, that's a, that's fade. That's a dissolve. I like it. I just looked to see where he is on Wikipedia, but yeah, he's seventy and um, no, but he's a yeah years with with Rat Dog and all kinds of amazing shit before that. You know the Shirelles and Billy Preston and Bo Diddley, all kinds of amazing. I tell you a funny, quick, quick story, kind of a little bit funny with Robin, which was when we were cutting Salt in My Tears, and it was actually that song. Um, yeah, that um, 
I guess it was Martin probably, or possibly Peter Coleman, one of us referenced uh, Free, All Right Now. And he said, I want to get the bass, like that All Right Now song, Free. So they send out, get the record. There was no Spotify. Come on, you have to go down to send the engineer, the second sure. engineer down, sure. Power Records, buy a cassette, bring it back. Let's listen to it and vibe off of what, what's going on there, which is the thing that Chapman used to do a lot, actually. We'd sit in the studio and just listen to Al Green for two or three hours and then go track and try and you know catch a feel like that which was another funny story because we were doing that once at united western and the door was open and a guy popped his head in and um it's willie they got willie green who is the producer of those records <laughs> and we had to admit that we were just trying to steal his vibe we were listening you know kind of making notes of, of other stuff uh, but the thing with Robin that was kind of funny was they wanted to reference that free All Right Now song and they would put on the record and there's no bass. It doesn't come in until the chorus. That's right. It's That's just right. those chords. I think the same thing in Salt in My Tears or whatever song we were working on then was, was the bass held out until that moment. Oh, you're kidding. Yes. Oh, dude, that was one of my first shows. Dude. Alice Cooper at Winterland, and they started with Sunrise, where, where they come out, I think it was Alice, I'm not sure, with a hammer. And he's hitting oh. the base of the microphone stand on the bass drum. It was a pretty powerful way to start a show. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, Pat. We'll yeah, wear your, wear your mask. This oh, is dude. my, you know, so many times I'm unprepared, so he just shows up. Dude, so besides right. wearing a real mask, I've always got another one in my pocket, another one around my neck. No, stay safe out there, both of you. Stay safe. Those numbers are crazy in, in Texas. Um, and um, we'll, we'll keep uh, staying in touch. Okay, dude. Right, and I should interview you sometime. I don't know where the camera is. <laughs> puts the camera on this, but you. I should interview you. Okay. No, that would be fun. No, it's good to see you. I will. We, Robin and I were saying, too, we hadn't seen you. We, we, we said goodbye in – in the in the lobby in Mexico City last yeah yeah <laughs> which was I remember bizarre that I we remember. that we figured out you were playing so hey, uh, you just made me remember that I did an interview with Tobias you can look online for that somewhere where this guy came in Germany that does a drum channel to do an interview with me and we were double drumming I said dude my buddy here and he said I got no questions for him so I said give me the microphone <laughs> so I do the Mike Douglas thing and interview Tobias Great. You can look for that. Uh, I will. And we'll put a bunch of links here and then we'll talk about the orc and the new material people should look for. Um, and, and of course, the, the duo record with Tobias. We need to people yeah. need to know about that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, all the links will be here. So. Okay. All right, buddy. I didn't know there was so much to talk about. Okay. You know, we're, we're only, we, we got through a third of it, believe me, because you've done a lot. And, and thank you for, thank you for being inspiring to, that you're not stopping. Talk to you yeah. soon. Okay.